Hi, uh, Dr. Garima here again. And today we'll be recording uh, one new question that was asked, which wasn't asked in so many years as I've been following up with the papers of September 2021 till date. And they were focused more on the public health dentistry this time, the community dentistry basically. And uh, since uh, we didn't know what they were going to ask and we don't know what goes on in Australia, uh, I think it was kind of a surprising question. Uh, it's not a question that you don't know about, but just that you never bothered to study more about it because you never thought it's going to be asked. So anyways, uh, open your Sob and Peter book again. <laughs> <laughs> on community dentistry but uh, focus more on the Australian aspect of it. Now where do you get these kind of study materials from their articles and today I am discussing about one this question I asked my enrolled candidates which video they want me to make. All of them kind of gave out this question so I'm making a video on it. Hope this helps you. So let's just start. So uh, the question was, uh, what should you do if you are the only dentist in a remote area with poor oral health of people around you and there is no reticulated water supply? What would you do to improve their oral health? Uh, what does the word reticulated mean? It means there is no calibration of how much fluoride is there in the water and practically there is no fluoride in the water. That, that is what it means. There is no reticulated water supply. There is no water supply which has a proper measurement of fluoride and most probably there is no fluoride in that. Now we all know how much important fluoride is. You know, uh, as a BDS student, I do get it when we keep on saying, you know, apply fluoride, do this, but we actually don't understand how the fluoride works. It has five different mechanism of actions, by the way. Uh, I don't remember all five of them, but the ones which I remember, because I studied this in my PG and fluoride was kind of my thesis. Uh, and beautifully given in various uh, textbooks, especially Nikhil Farooq. I think I mentioned this textbook many times. Anyways, what fluoride does basically in a system, uh, systematic way, if it's ingested, when the child is developing, basically when the teeth are developing, uh, you know, all our teeth have fissures and grooves, the molars, basically. So, uh, fluoride, uh, if taken in appropriate amount, uh, in children when the tooth is developing I would stick to the teeth uh, the fissures and the grooves are smoother and less deeper this is one of the actions so if they are smoother and less deeper means less chances of uh, uh, getting the class 1 cavities second one is uh, the crystals the hydroxyapatite crystals now this you know uh, fluor appetite crystals are way stronger than hydroxyapatite crystals so if fluoride is there, then it strengthens the crystals more. Thirdly, uh, to a certain extent, it has antibacterial properties towards streptococcus mutants. So that. Fourth, uh, it lessens the dissolution of uh, the tooth structure when it's under acid attack. Basically, uh, if fluoride is present, then uh, the tooth may not dissolve at that critical pH of 5.5. Maybe it needs to go down a little more because it's still a better protection is provided with because of the fluoride. And I think fifth was it helps in better remineralization. And that's why we say keep on applying fluoride varnish because its presence uh, acts more faster, has more, uh, you know, in those incipient lesions, uh, when there is actually not a cavitation happening, it's just a white spot, it can reverse back to the normal because fluoride helps in taking calcium from the saliva and formation of the fluorapatite crystals and forming a protective layer at the same time having an antibacterial property. So uh, I, I would someday make a video in that I would actually sit with the textbook and make the video. It's a beautiful textbook. Uh, if I have time, I, I don't mind opening it. I actually searched that textbook when I went back home today. It was kept in, you know, that upper cupboard <laughs> at my home. My mom kept it. She was like, you finished your PG. What are you going to do with your books? I'm like, you know what? Let me take it back to Dubai. And I kept it on my bookshelf out here. So anyways, so this is the question. And this is why fluoride comes into picture and why there's an actual question upon fluoride. So if you are the alone dentist in a remote area, uh, with a lot of poor health, poor oral health of people around you. See, you as a dentist, I understand. If a patient comes to you, you treat them. If you are the alone one in a community, you kind of become responsible for the oral health.
health of the community as well. Your job is not just restricted to you working only in your clinic. You understand? It's 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 giving back to the community as well. So, anyways, uh, now I've changed a bit of pattern and explanation right now here because what I've understood from this exam is that uh, the questions that I've provided in the mocks are uh, the same that are asked in the exam, but with a different scenario. So basically, the concept is the same. So if I have provided uh, questions in my mocks about, which are basically the past ADC papers, it's not my questions, it's ADC questions. So what I've seen them is that, for example, if they have taken a topic fluoride, they can ask A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z questions on it. So if so far they have asked questions on fluoride, say on topics A, B, C, now they are asking about D, E, F, X, Y, Z, okay? So if you are going to micro study the fluoride topic only on the ABC topics, then if the same question is asked, you can answer. But if a different question is asked in a different scenario, but of the same topic, you're having a problem. So I decided why not just teach you A to Z about that topic so that no matter what questions are asked, you're still able to answer. You get my point? So I've kind of prepared a small PPT presentation here. Let's see. So you being the dentist, now the scenario is you are a dentist in a remote area and you're kind of responsible for the community oral health as well, apart from treating the patients in your own clinic. So what would you do? So in your question, in your exam, if a question like this is asked, any of these options can come and you choose whichever option is correct and one option will be correct. So oral health education and promotion. Your first job is that conduct community awareness programs on the importance of oral hygiene, diet, especially sugar intake and the link between oral and general health. Provide demonstrations on proper brushing and flossing techniques. Educate parents about the importance of children's oral health, including early dental visits. And I have this, I've taken all this from the Australian articles. I have not taken this from a textbook. Okay. Fluoride supplementation. Since there is no reticulated water, so no option of water fluoridation, consider the alternatives. Now, what would be your alternatives? Fluoride varnish applications during dental visits, safe and effective, especially for children. Advocate for fluoride toothpaste and ensure its availability. Ensure its availability, okay? <laughs> in local stores or distributed through health promotion programs. Explore the feasibility of community level fluoride mouth rinse programs, example, weekly rinses in schools under supervision. So basically, you have to take that extra step whenever the patient comes to you. You have to make him aware that you see you live in a community where there is no water so i would recommend you to use a fluoride toothpaste even though the patient has not asked for it so one of the options can be you are increasing awareness by promoting fluoride toothpaste and that's a correct answer preventive services establish routine screening and preventive care schedules especially for school children apply pressure sealants to children's molars where appropriate Encourage regular checkups even when asymptomatic. Very important. Collaborate with local health workers. Train and empower local health workers on community health volunteers to help with oral hygiene promotion and basic screening. Basically, you collaborate with local health workers and educate them, ask them, help them. I mean, help them and ask them to help others to spread this awareness. Work alongside other healthcare providers, example GP, nurses, to include oral health and general health discussions as well. Yeah, you see, this is what I feel is very biased, you know, this is the entire world. All the insurance also. So, general health discussions, why you eliminate the oral health? Isn't it a part of your body? But yeah, somehow that's the tendency. Like you go for a journal checkup, they'll do everything except your teeth. They'll be like, go to the dentist. Well, you can check the teeth. You don't know what teeth are made up of. Just open the mouth. If you see a big black spot, then refer to the dentist. But at least open the mouth. When they open the mouth, they only see the tongue. They feel the teeth are non-existent for them. <laughs> Anyways. Advocate for infrastructure improvement. Advocate for long-term solutions like establishing a safe community water source. That could be fluoridated in the future. Example, fluoridated tank water systems or bore water treatment, anything. Lobby with the local government or NGOs for support for resources and infrastructure. So you'd know there is no reticulated water supply. Now, are you going to 
do nothing about it like you need to find a solution and one of the permanent solutions a long term solution would be this <clears throat> get the reticulation done get the fluoride in the water but how tank water systems go water treatment you know so there are many countries where they don't have fluoride and that's why we add fluoride in the water we measure it so if you know it there is not there then you need support then you should be you know talking to the governments and doing it that also falls in your uh, forte then you know documentation and feedback monitor oral health status over time using simple community surveys or clinical data use that data to adjust interventions and advocate for more resources now this link that i've provided here is the one from which and there were two three other articles from where i gathered all this and the heading of that article is this i will just show you here i have just opened it out yeah you see this demonstration of high value care to improve oral health of a remote indigenous community in australia so this article was published in 2020 which is quite recent so uh, i i did my research and i got articles belonging to australia not in journal around the world so i hope this presentation helps you and now if any question is being asked what you as a dentist should do if and any of these options are given now you know how to answer you are a bit more educated now about this than you were before right so uh this this presentation is open for all and even if you are a candidate with me who has not enrolled and you have uh doubts about the questions uh, that were asked in the exam and you don't know have an answer to you don't know whom to ask uh then just write that question in the comment section here i'll make a presentation like this encompassing everything which i know about there can be more you can also share more if you have in the comment section and like i said if you leave a comment i will just uh, make a presentation and make another video about it it does take time for me to gather all the resources but then if it helps you all uh, this is me giving back to the community yes i cannot give fluoride water to and uh, <laughs> remote area <laughs> but spreading knowledge uh, it's me empowering you all to do that wherever you are right and uh, so yeah have a nice day bye bye